you have to just believe that there's magic out there if you're starting something like a press because there's no there's no logical reason to start a press and there's no business sense to starting a press you just have to believe that there are wings built of light that will let you fly Red Hen's been publishing for 13 years. Um, I wouldn't exactly go so far as to say 13 wonderful years. It's much more like a marriage. There were some wonderful moments in an ideal marriage um, like that. There have been some wonderful moments with Red Hen. Um, and then a lot of crazy hard work in between, keeping the whole show going. Red Hen Press publishes 20 books a year. Half of that is poetry and half is fiction, nonfiction. And the fiction nonfiction has been everything from short stories, novels, counterculture, to memoirs, uh, sort of quite a range. I would say everything is, is literary fiction or literary nonfiction uh, with the intention of publishing work that the establishment publishers would be ignoring. As far as I'm concerned, if you could have just as easily gotten published by not, why didn't you? Why don't you just go ahead and do that? So Red Hen really wants to find writers that are being ignored for, for whatever reason. Sometimes it's, you know, that they're otherwise gendered and so their writing is seen as different. Uh, sometimes they're a poet that, that just writes in a way that's somewhat different. One of, Elaine is in my favorite of the uh, Red Hen lineup is uh, Doug Kearney. He's really different. He's got these poems that are that are academic and these spoken word poems and he puts it together in a particular way that is quite astonishing and I think many more traditional poetry publishers would have looked at his book and said what do you do with this you know would have felt like it didn't fit so Red Hen was the perfect home. Well Red Hen Press has had a wonderful three-year relationship with the Ruskin Art Club. Um, it started with my meeting up with Elena and Elena Karina Byrne had been running the PSA series and I had been to some of the events and I said, what are you doing now? And she said she was working with the Ruskin Art Club and that, that they wanted to have some poetry events there. And so we decided to just jump in and get started. And our very first event here, we had Tracy Smith reading with Eloise Klein Healy. And so there are all these African-American writers and readers and all these gay lesbian readers and writers to hear. And it was just this very crazy kind of crowd. And uh, afterwards, this very elderly person from the Ruskin board came up to me and she said, I love what you're doing here. I just love it. <laughs> and I was so excited because I was very much wondering how it was going to feel to the Ruskin people to have this sort of invasion of the poets who are actually fairly crazy people. And the Ruskin people seemed fairly sane, but they loved it. They loved the energy. They loved the different kinds of people coming in. They loved the students coming in. So it's been great. Our intention was to take lesser known poets and put them with more known poets. So today's reading was an example of that. Nicole Brown is an emerging poet. Juan Felipe Pereira is a very much established writer. And so putting the two of them together brings in different kinds of audiences. So that's what we've tried to do. Um, usually half the writers in an entire series are Red Hen people who are featuring. And then we've brought in, you know, C.D. Wright, Lee Young Lee, Joy Harjo, some really wonderful, uh, quite established writers to read with some of our uh, authors. And it's, it's been a good collaboration, I think. Well, Elena, one of the things I think was interesting when we started working together was you had been associated with the PSA, and I think you really had a sense of the national scope of poetry. And Red Hen at that point was very much dedicated to California poets. Right. So it seemed to me that once we put our heads together, there was this uh, synergy where you had ideas of poets that you wanted to, to see come in here who I wouldn't have thought of because I tended to think much more locally. And, and as it's emerged at this point, I think we both kind of think both ways together. You come up with local ideas that I haven't thought of too. Yeah, but. Kate and I have a, a, I mean, I think we realized this right away when we first met that we have a good balance of, of and, and on both levels of, of interests and, and um, 
poets and not just poets, but writers that um, that come to mind that we think would would ignite uh, certain types of audiences. Poets will stay in their comfort zones and and um, and they'll cheer on the team, their their team, so to speak. And, uh, well, I think you were very interested in breaking up those circles of comfort. You know, I would say to you, well, we've got this poet coming, she's, you know, a, a well-known lesbian poet, and you'd say, let's have something completely different. So I felt like <laughs> that idea of not just bringing out the gay lesbian crowd to cheer for each other, but let's have, right. let's have these groups meet each other. Um, and, and when I looked at the kind of programming you've been doing, it was what I considered really adventurous. Hmm. Um, we were trying. It took a while to develop that. It took a while to realize that you weren't just serving uh, a need for your organization that you were serving a community and you were serving you know an, an outside interest and then there, and then I had my own personal interest but but usually that came last nevertheless if you bring all of those elements together as Kate and I figured out it's 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 great when you have a wild balance as we did today right with the two right. poets I mean you know you it's it sort of makes you sit up in your seat for a moment as a poet that's you know more outspoken and maybe more spoken word and and uh, uses a lot of wild vernacular and then there's another poet that's more formal and more more um, you know has has a, a different type of inscape going on and so you know this this is this is life this is balance and fun <laughs> I started writing poetry when I was a teenager and I would write in these journals and I would bury the journals. And so for many years I would write poetry in journals and then just kind of bury them and, you know, like with a shovel out into the woods, up with the leaves, bury the journal, done. And I still really like that idea because I think for two reasons. One, I think everything we're doing creatively is ephemeral. It matters very much in the moment. It matters during the reading. And that not all of it matters in the long run. Um, and I think it's good to remember that, you know, you're human, you don't live with Apollo. Um, but I also think that um, when I started working on a master's and later in my PhD program, I began to learn what the craft of poetry meant. And so I decided not to bury all of the poetry. So eventually got some published and that was good. But I still think it's good to be willing to bury your poetry once in a while. <laughs>